Hello. Okay, we have so much to cover, so I'm going to start. That's a very tiny table. You're very, you're very close to one another. Okay, so welcome to this panel. Uh, this is the production design panel, which is the best panel at LA <laughs> Expo. So congratulations on meeting you. Um, and today we have the most amazing panelists ever that I'm very honored to introduce right now. So I'm going to share with you their normal bios and also a cool fun fact about them that maybe no one else in the world knows. Probably not everyone, but at least lots of people. Okay, I'm going to start off with Helen Mingdre Chen. Uh, she's worked at Paramount Animation, Walt Disney Animation, and is currently working as a production designer at Sony Pictures Animation. She's contributed to such films as Big Hero 6, Wish Dragon, Raya and the Last Dragon, and is production designer for K-pop Demon Hunter, which is in pre-production at Sony. on anything. <laughs> That's my favorite one. Okay. And there's Paul Escape. He's legendary. He's an artist who's worn lots of different hats. And because I have the bio wrong, I'm going to read this off my phone. <laughs> Get it right? Okay. Give me a second here. Okay. He's an LA-based production designer and concept artist best known for his work on the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, he began his career in film as a traditional matte artist at Disney Studios' in-house VFX department, to transition to concept art and animation in the mid-90s. He won the annual award for Best Production Design for his work on Lifeway Entertainment's The Box Trolls, and has credits on dozens of feature films, including Spider-Man, Into the Spider-Verse, uh, Storks, The Box Trolls, Surf's Up, Open Season, and, like I said, Lord of the Rings films. Also, The Prince of Egypt, Alien 3, Batman Returns, and Dick Tracy. Currently, he's also the production designer on Marvel Studios' What If. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. And the fun fact is he's memorized all fake butter ingredients for butter popcorn because he's asked so many times at the Galleria movie theater. And so when there's a Q&A section at the end, you can all ask him what that is. And that brings us so I'm going to skip over to Mike Knapp, who I'm really excited about your fun fact because in Q&A, she'll ask him to perform, not to give it away. Okay, Mike Knapp began his career at Blue Sky Studios, where he was a designer on robots. <laughs> he went on to art direct animated um, films such as Epic, Ice Age, Dawn of the Dinosaurs, and production design on Spies in Disguise. Since Blue Sky's closing in early 2021, he's done visual development and character design work for multiple live action and animated features and streaming projects at Netflix, Amazon, DNEG, and more. And his fun fact is he plays in post-punk bands, and he's recorded a solo record album last year, which y'all should ask him to perform during the Q&A session. Yeah! Okay. Oh, he's also a production designer on Secret Tales, which is Blue Sky's swan song. Scratch Tales. Scratch Tales. Okay. Uh, yay! Okay, Paul Felix. Uh, Paul Felix joined Disney in 95 and has since production design on Raya and the Last Dragon, Big Hero 6, Lilo and Stitch, Bolt, The Emperor's New Group, just to name a few of many. And I just learned that he's moved to Skydance recently and cannot talk about what project he's working on because he may not know yet, <laughs> but he, his fun fact is he was actually for a while Mickey Mouse's portrait artist. <laughs> okay, and last but not least, wait, wait, no, there's two more. Okay, Christophe Lundret. <laughs> Christophe Lundret first joined DreamWorks on their first full-length animated film, The Prince of Egypt, as a layout artist. That was the beginning of a 21 career, year career at DreamWorks, where he, his contributions including production design of Crudes and the B Movie. And in 2016, he left DreamWorks and joined Paramount Pictures as production designer for Rumble. And he currently is working as a prod designer at, uh, on The Tiger's Apprentice. 
And uh, his fun fact is he used to work at a hospital delivering mail to offices. <laughs> and he really enjoyed it. It was really fun. Okay, last but not least is Jeff Turley. Jeff is currently a production designer at Pixar. Previously, he was at Blue Sky, Disney, and Paramount, where he production designed Mary Poppins Returns and Feast. And he was also the art director on the Oscar award-winning short Paper Man. And, and little known fact is he was a vacuum cleaner salesman, and he thought he was going to be a firefighter, which is also super badass. And, and he would have been the best so that he could jump out of airplanes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Did you know that Adam Driver was also a vacuum cleaner salesman? So fact. Yes, that was exactly <laughs> could start a commercial when you become a horse. Okay, so starting off with a bunch of questions. The first one is uh, asking a pretty easy one, but, oh, first of all, how many of you are students? Okay, a lot of you. How many are you, of you are in the industry right now? Okay, it's pretty even split. Okay, cool. Okay, so, uh, I'm thinking that everybody has a different design process when doing production design when you start. So I was wondering if you could just start from my nap and come over about what is your process and how it might be different from other people that you've observed um, in your work. You want us to go down the line? Yeah, I'm going to start that way and work from this way. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how, I don't really have a, I, I was just at loose time, so like, you know, I've been kind of alive and students. But um, you know, a lot of it when you break down the script and you start breaking down what uh, what 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 shape language relates to you usually you start with characters, right? So a lot of the shape language comes from characters that you break it down to how it affects the world and thinking about lighting and color. It's really trying to get a head start on all that, gathering all kinds of reference, um, pulling the team together and trying to establish the rules as, as early as you can to to distinguish you know the film you're working on. Um, and then, and hit the ground running, and get a lot of things not approved over and over again. <laughs> Start making headway. So. Oh. Um, I think it's pretty similar. I, I think the biggest thing I like trying to do is get in sync with the director and sort of start talking about films that they like or uh, visually what, what excites them about the project. And then I'm just pulling together mostly reference and doing sketches um, that really are just, just more informative for, just for us. Um, and at the same time, we're pulling together teams, you know, working with talent to sort of like identify who keeps on the and building the team that way. And then it's really like a lot of reference until we get started. And it, um, one of the first things to do is try to get early designs out for uh, the story to work. Because, you know, they don't leave something and it's just a map. So, that's general how we start. Yeah, I, mean, like, I feel like we're all going to say some sort of sentence. Like, okay, I would like for you to say what can I say? Like, your process sucks. Yeah, seriously, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, my, my process is like, just absolute panic. Like, that's <laughs> like honestly, it's like, I, I thrive off of that. But I, I do connect with what Paul said. I, it's like you, you want to be best buds with the director, you know, um, whoever they are, and and then you know you have to think why did they hire you, you know, uh, because if you know why they hired you and you, they understand why they think you're valuable, you want to lean into that. Um, and then another thing is, you know, if, if that's true, then they want to know what your voice is. So I think the first thing is just to kind of like react uh, once you understand what. About, what you like, uh, they're kind of looking for your reaction to their film. And so you try to put out the best work you can, and all the prep work, all the designs, you know, lots of research. That's something that I think was a huge shock because you're constantly looking for photos. So you get really good at like, photo collecting me, becoming a reporter. Uh, but yeah, I think it's just, it's really connected with the That's the difference. I do everything that that guy told me. You know, so, <laughs> so we can jump. No, no. Um, so yeah, everything has been said. Uh, uh, definitely, I think. Uh, so for me, I never really read the script. 
uh, kind of learn that the script will evolve tremendously you know, through the years, and it's a long process. You know, you have like three to four, sometimes five years of production. You know, I expect that the director will be different two years from now. You know. So, nonetheless, you know, the collaboration with the directors is the best collaboration you can have. That's why I don't read the script, because I'd rather have coffee with them, share ideas, you know, gain the trust of the director, you know, sharing ideas, and really trying to have my voice in the movie. Because, you know, again, the movie is so long for production that you need to control every aspect of it. And it better be your movie as well, not just the director. You know, you have so many answers to give to so many people that I think, you know, the more you own it, the more it's a baby, you know, the more answers you have all along the process of the production, even if the director basically vanishes and you have a, a new one coming up. So, Star Guy, you know, as well, Star Guy is really important, it's basically what those guys have said, you know, meeting a Star Guy, and it's just to make, to put at ease the studio, the executive, the producers, and everybody is holding hands together and saying, okay, this is the adventure we're going to have together. So, You know, it's funny because every time I've worked on a project, it's been completely different. The process is different. Um, but I, over the years, the one thing I've found that seems to be the most successful um, thing, way to start is to find the team, for me, that's better than me. Um, because God knows you're going to be cranking out so much artwork. And it's a lot of pressure and a lot of work that needs to get done. And you personally, as the production designer, you're, you're responsible for all of it. So if you have a team of people, and I, I like to think of it as, I remember there was, a, there was a quote, I think it was at Catmull, who said something about like, don't ever try to be the smartest person in the room. You know, it's totally fine to get people who are smarter than you, because they make you look good. So I, I, I try to do the same thing when I'm putting together a team of people, and that really is the first thing. Who am I gonna get? Who's gonna be my, my painting lead? Who's gonna be my, my tuning layout lead? Who's gonna be my props person? And it's not that you can, I mean, yes, you can lean on them, but they're really going to do all the heavy-duty legwork. You're going to you're going to guide them. You're going to help them go in, in a certain direction, but they're going to do so much of the stuff, um, and um, they're going to do all the legwork. So, to me, that is ultimately the most important thing in your team. Everything that they said to you, you know, make have a coffee with the director, um, figure out what the story is. If you've got a good script, read it. I feel like I feel like I'm gonna have to be struggling to find answers to every question. <laughs> I'll start with you first. <laughs> Like art to be, you know, paintings and stuff to get ideas. Like you can't just go through 
number that worked. But it sure does look like there has been some. Yeah, I know. I mean, um, but, but usually what I'll do is like, I'll put it this way, and I, and I did this my entire career, is like if I get a note that I kind of disagree with, instead of um, uh, told like just not doing it, I'll, I'll do the version they asked for, and then I'll do another version that solves the problem, and maybe in a way that's different, that I, that I, can, that I like. And then um, I'll show, uh, you know, my fashion designer at the time, or the director was full of options. And, you know, 50% of the time, they go with the, the one that I was invested in solving in a, in a cool way. So it's like, just try it, you know. But disagreements are bad. It's not bad for the production. Nobody's going to take it personally. It's just part of it. I, I don't know. I haven't taken it personally. I mean, uh, for, for me, it, it depends on the director. I mean, and I think what, what you guys were all saying about making that relationship um, and getting that relationship going is super important <clears throat> early on. Um, <clears throat> figuring out who they are, what they like, what they don't like. Um, I mean, like you said, sit down and have a coffee with them so that when the inevitable disagreements happen, and they will, they'll happen every day. Uh, because it was funny when you said, you know, to think about a time when you had a disagreement with the director, literally every day. <laughs> but um, it's how you deal with it. And, you know, you, you want to be an adult and you hope that they're an adult and you know you just have to kind of read the room. Um, I've definitely had directors who I can argue with and I've had directors you just don't argue with. There was one director who I actually had a really great relationship with, but I we did have a disagreement. It was fine, it was totally a fine disagreement. And but I I didn't think the way he wanted to go on something was correct. So I I did a painting, he loved it. He totally approved it, and then when it came to putting it into film, he did it his way. So, you know, you, you can, and so that's, that's, I mean, the table, or the, the, the lesson to learn is you might still win the argument, you're still going to lose the war because at the end of the day, you're right there, they're the But what you said about, like, do what they want, do something else, maybe you can sell it. I think that's, you know, I'll do that a lot. We all do that. Yeah, um, actually, you said, one, thing, one time, which I, which I remember, is pick your battle, you know? And this one is really important as well. You know, pick your battle, you know, you won't win every time, you won't lose every time, you know, and you pick what's really important for you. And when it's really important for you, yeah, you fight for it, for sure. You know, because you know, you know, it's right? a better movie at the end, you know? Um, I had an experience of um, disagreement, you know, on groups. Um, it does big well, actually, you know, like, I started a movie, did a style guide, sold the project to the company, went on with all the, you know, the, the production piece, you know, um, character design and everything. Then the movie went on hold for quite a while because the director had to jump into a different project, you know. Uh, he came back a month later with a different taste, you know. He want, you know, that movie in between, you know, kind of gave him a different idea of what the show was supposed to be, but I was, Still on my, you know, on my paradigm of visual that uh, I had put on the table, and worked so hard you know, with the team to, to work on it, you know. Uh, so that was a big one because I told him, I said, well, I'm not the guy for that, you know. Like if you want something else, then buy somebody else. It's really simple, you know. I this is what I put on the table, and I believe in this one, you know. So that was a big battle because we had to go to the studio and you know, kind of divide and not divide, but like we need to come up with an agreement at the end of the day. We need an agreement, you know. Um, but it was, I mean, it wasn't bad in the sense that, again, if I wasn't the guy for the job, it, it was completely fine as well. I would have leave the project and would, they would have put someone who maybe match, you know, the project a bit better. But um, for me, you know, you have to fight for what you believe as well. I don't think you can do a project that you don't believe or you cannot control, you know, this, in the design for three years to four years. It's going to be a struggle on a daily basis. So, you know, I always try to pick stuff that I feel like, yeah, I can, I can handle that, I can control that. Yeah, I did great, great answers. <laughs> like, I think. <laughs> I, 
your point, disagreement is based off of pure bias, or is it actually helpful? And another thing is, there's so many facets to production design. There's technical things that you have to, you know, get over. There's staffing issues. There's all you can, if you can imagine it. Those are the things you have to deal with. Um, I try to I try to choose my arguments based off creative arguments because those are the most worthwhile ones. Um, and if they're good enough, uh, I will disagree until they kick me out of the room. And I, I have left rooms before out of anger <laughs> on paperback, actually. Um, but, you know, I, the, the one thing that I do, and I do this all the time now, is like when I work with a director, I like tell them up front, like, I'm a little nuts. I will disagree with you. I'll probably have an argument with you. You'll probably hate me at one point this time. But let's agree to have a beer. No matter if we get an argument, let's have a beer. Um, just to have like a sort of like unwritten contract that these things will happen and we have to respect each other. Uh, and even if we can't see it in the room at the moment, that we'll have a way to get out of it. So, yeah. I can't agree with what everyone is saying here. And uh, uh, Helen made this great point that if you can present visually another idea to the director. Every director I work with is so heavily invested in the story that if you can give them something that that you know that tells the story better or more clearly, they'll really take it into serious consideration. I mean, once I could have I could, another option for one of the bot fighting robots in uh, Big Hero Six, and Chris Williams, one of the directors, I'm sure he lost sleep that night wondering if my solution was better or what. Because they, they take all this stuff so seriously. Um, if you can make it stand on that ground, so much the better. Um, the other thing is, if you set some visual rules really early on, if you know what form, style, caricature, what your, what your style of form is, you know, if you can defend something in that ground based on rules that you set up early, then you have a better chance. Um, but as far as like direct disagreements with directors, I'm just way too passive. <laughs> I usually just try to do everything I can. Like Helen says, I always give them the solution that they ask for in addition. I don't think I've ever had a real disagreement with the director or had to fight back in any way, but I've always had a pretty good relationship with other directors. But directors, um, some are more visual than others, some are more investing in design than others, and so some will be happy to defer to um, you and, and the choices that you're making. And, and the thing, you, know, you, you come to this agreement early about the style and how you're going to like go into investigations generally and compose things. Um, but sometimes, some directors are a little more opaque than others and they're just a little harder to read. So I, I, I've only one director where was, I really struggled trying to like mind melt uh, with them. And it, it went on for like a little while. Um, and, and that one wasn't about, it wasn't about disagreements as much as it was about you really want to get to a point where you're intuitive in your design choices and how you're setting things up. Because you want every scene to be designed in a way that's going to accommodate the action and the staging. And, and this one director um, he had very, very specific ideas about how things were staging from his experience in animation. And, and, and sometimes we just you know, did not like connect. And so it was like, I just have to take a step back and kind of see how he was really trying to frame things and then try to accommodate that so I wasn't getting in the way. Because the last thing you want is the designs to get in the way of how the director uh, sees the scene in their head. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act of, of trying to make sure that you are supporting the story, but you're still trying to keep the integrity of, of the design and maintain the relationship. I love how all your answers are so different based off of personality. So I'm like, this is the way I am. And the others are like, I can adapt to any person. So. There's no right way, I guess, is what I'm taking away from you all. Um, my next set of questions is about house style. And I'm going to start with Paul Felix. <laughs> so you were at Disney for a long time and part of the leadership team. How do you, you know, Disney is known for an iconic, in a way, house style. How do you balance between the house style and also bringing in the new, um, and new trends in art or finding something new? And then I'm going to ask for the rest of you also to chime in also on that because you've been at places both with house styles and places that are like Sony for Big Joy that prides itself on not having a house style. Right. It's, it's always been a big conversation at Disney um, was 
the industry perception that we have a house now, but we never consciously pursued having one. And you know, we have. You could argue that there's like some like a pastel animation that's you know particular to Disney, um, but as far as like the visual style, we, we try to we try to go, we always try to go, go from, from scratch. I mean, we're it's really a, a larger conversation with the directors, the producer, and the studio leadership too that also figures into you know what how a style evolves. But we we've, we've never been like invested in the idea that we have to maintain a look that we've built over the decades. I mean, if you look at like, what Jeff did with Superman and Peace, that we were very consciously trying to break out and try something new, and that's still continuing. Okay. How about you, Helen? You were, many of you were, <laughs> you talked about that and how it might be different with Sony or, or similar. Uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty new to Sony. I've only been there for like a year and a half, two years now. Um, and it's just like, I, I don't know if I'm answering that question, but it's just like a lot of pressure, <laughs> like falling spiders. Like, I, 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 I don't know. Um, uh, of course, everybody wants to do something interesting and something that feels true to the movie and to, um, you know, their sensibilities. And, and that's all I'm trying to focus on because I, I feel like, for me, um, and, and I think that that's kind of the nature of the studios to uh, kind of maybe contribute a little bit to the perception. Like Disney is all one studio, the same people, um, or you know, like from, from film to film, and you know, um, and so I, I feel like it's, a, it's natural that there would be some um, you know similarities. You build sensibilities. And working at Disney, I started out um, really liking anime, and my art was way more influenced by that. But working at Disney, it slowly kind of uh, changed as well. And Sony's different because um, it feels like like three or four different like little mercenary teams. All of the groups are very different. Um, uh, all of the Vista teams don't even necessarily share artists from show to show, uh, which is not the case for a studio like Disney. So I think that that helps um, kind of foster like how they're able to do something so different, like Mitchells and uh, Spider Verse and all that. But for me personally, the biggest takeaway is that I'm just so intimidated to be working there and to be expected to come up with something brand new. But um, hopefully, whatever it ends up being, it just supports the story and the, the movie at the end of the day. And that's what the goal should be. Anybody else? You know, it's funny. I, I, I think that these days, the house style concept is, is really kind of diminishing. I think most of the studios pretty invested in the idea that they all need to kind of up their game and I mean I think you know like like Paul you were saying that you know, Disney doesn't have a house style or tries not to and I, I, I would agree with that especially you know even as we you know as time moves on. I think you look back in history and it, I mean obviously certainly Disney had a house style. It was just because this is what animation was. It really wasn't a whole heck of a lot out there other than than you know, I mean, I'm talking about Disney of the 50s and 60s to 40s. Um, and you had Warner Brothers, you know, doing it. The, you know, cartoons, that was certainly different. But they even shared artists. You saw a lot of the same people, you know, working on, on the, you know, the, the Looney Tunes. They were Disney animators. Um, but I think these days there's so many studios out there now. That, that it's not even the Tao styles. Everybody's trying to find their thing. And... Uh, I think the studios are, are even very consciously trying to avoid. We don't want it to look like Spider Verse because Spider Verse already did that. Or, you know, so if you do anything that's remotely similar to that last project, we kind of shun that. I've been fortunate or unfortunate enough to jump from studio to studio quite a bit. I think the longest I've been at a studio is four years. So there's, I mean, there, there is no house stop for me. It's just whatever the show it happens to be. I think. My experience at Leica was probably the closest to a house style because being stop motion just has its, its kind of quirky look. Um, even though Box Trolls was a very, very different kind of look than what they've already done before. But it's still, no matter what, looks like. You, you, you look at it and you go, it's either, it's either Leica or Henry Selleck. Um, and, uh, but yeah, there's, there's, I think now's a really awesome time. There's so much going on. Yeah, yeah I have a question. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, was to say, because I think there's something that I was thinking about. Like I think like technologies often dictates how style. Uh, like, <clears throat> for instance, when you look 
back, uh, we said, saw the jump to 101 Dalmatians with that, that unit. Like there was aristocrats, there was one-on-one -on -one donations, they had a Xerox copy technology, which was a way to do things really quickly. And then, you know, you get to the advent of Pixar, you know, creating 3D animation, and now suddenly everybody wants to do that and not 2D animation. So it may not be like more of a, like a design thing, but I do feel like technology often dictates even today. Because when you're running into, like say, Paul's like, I want to do something different on this film, and it's just really the director of the one's one. Um, the first thing you do is you do pie the sky ideas. You're like, it would be so cool if I could make something look like this. And then you, you know, somebody technical will say, well, that would take a million years. Um, so, but to, if you're lucky, you might have somebody who's like, hey, I can write a program for that. So I think the house style often is like the gatekeepers are the ones that are the people that go through the slog of making something that's very technically difficult because there's no tools for that. Stop, I have a question for you specifically. You mentioned in the last schoolism panel that we did, and you talked about today how it so matters what project you decide to work on. And there's some that you're just not a good fit on. And because feature films take, animated films take a while, you want to wake up every day being excited about that project. Can you tell me about a project that you felt especially symbolic with, and then also maybe a project that you turned down or you decided you didn't want to be a production designer on because it wasn't a good fit? Yeah, I mean, so um, I have different projects that I love for different reasons. You know, Prince of Egypt, for example, was definitely a project that was extremely inspiring because it was the first work in DreamWorks, and I was working with people like, oh, you know, was my supervisor. Um, therefore, at the time, you know, I was young, I was 23, and I learned a lot, I was in the position of learning tremendously, you know, so it is special today for that reason, you know. Um, Eldorado was specific, special as well because of the art director, Richard Schulebaum, was an excellent draftman and, uh, you know, I love his style and, you know, I wanted to learn how he does it, so he gets special for that matter, you know. Uh, Kung Pana was definitely one of the most special, I think, that I've done. Um, this one, because I was the first one in the show, uh, I got the script, um, you know what to do with it. You know, but that was that overwhelming feeling of you know having a screen of 140 pages and starting from a wide blank page. You know, there's nothing more accelerating than that. You know, and people are counting on you to deliver something. You know, and, um, therefore, you know, I had blue. That was the first time where I had a lot of blue sky, mm -hmm. and I like I like exploration, I like mistake, I like you know drafting stuff that doesn't work or less. I mean, for me, you know the the the. the there's no destination, the journey is a destination, so that's what I like to do. I like to explore a project where you get really square, it's behind you, you have you know, not too many control at the end. You know. But exploring something is priceless, and when the company trusts you to do that, well, I mean, you're there, and it's, you know, you're right. Um, and the clues, again, for the blue sky, you know. Of course, and here I was a bit more mature, I know exactly what I wanted. I saw the movie done before it was even pinch to me, you know, and so this one was pretty specific. Uh, I didn't turn down, turn down a project, I turned down, I mean, I had to leave a company who suggested a movie to me that I didn't, I couldn't stand, I read the script, I was like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and they said, well, it's dark or nothing, I'm like, well, goodbye, everybody, you know, you know so, and, I, and I'm fortunate to have done that because I would have suffered and you know, I don't want to lose my sleep over it and argue with my kids and kick my dog, you know, I didn't know. <laughs> so, yeah, pick your, pick your movies. <laughs> okay. Like now, this is a little jumping around, but I have a question from Johnny Chandra. Uh, <laughs> by the way, at my studio, I, I realized I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Maureen Fan, I'm CEO, co-founder of Bayo Box Studio. Very okay, but Johnny's at our company, and Johnny was head of story at Blue Sky, and he wants to know, first, why you're so handsome, and two, how do you use previous as part of your design process? Um, I'll answer the second part. Okay. Um, uh, previous, uh, it was, previous was interesting, because there was, there was a little tension between previous and Leia, um, and, and who got 
that first thing you said about figuring out shots and stuff, and it always depends on because the whole point was we just need to figure out in 3D how these ideas are going to work as quickly as we can. It doesn't have to be in the final layout version, we just need to get it locked out. So a lot of times I would, when I would come on to a film, I would discover that the previous department was not in the state that I had left it. And, and I had to advocate to try to build it back up again and, and get in and, and try to involve layout, you know, try, try to get everybody happy and working together. And it was, it was a little challenge uh, on some shows. Um, I feel like on Spies it was pretty successful. It, we need to go for some part of it. And that came together. But getting into 3D is as fast as possible, always a huge, huge aspect. Um, usually the, I would try to get through thumbnails too, to mock up some 3D, but almost immediately. Because once the directors see it, even roughly, um, then you can have a really informed conversation about what your light source is, what your real estate point of view be. Every Ice Age movie is a travel picture, so you're always moving like from one place to the next, you rarely come back to a set. But then in um, Epic, we had Mama's House, which we shot five sequences inside the house, one at a few different every time. So we spent a lot of time uh, mocking out the three so we could figure out how we could approach cameras and see each time how the dressing is going to change. Or maybe it's just the light is going to change every time of day. So I, I, was, I, I always advocated to get as much in the as possible. Um, as early as we could, just so we can all agree. And then move forward. Because then everybody has something to come to, and then they understand. Even the facts, if people down the pipeline can start looking ahead and see what to expect when you go, and it's not just based on storyboards. It's interesting, you said that there was like a like a battle between previs and layout. In places I've worked, previs and layout were the same part. Eventually we got to that place. Okay. And, and, so and that, that's the Because we had, exactly. And, and we, had a, we had a layout department before we had a previs and then somebody else had spearheaded like this previous process. And it actually started in design. Like on Ice Age 2, we had um, we, we had a couple of, of lighters who were, had architectural backgrounds on robots. And so they helped us mock up models and stuff to start figuring out the city and, and how that might work. But it was all part of the design process. They were like embedded in the design department. And and then that was jettisoned uh, after robots and then uh, Dan Lopez and I actually like did all of our own previous like drove everybody crazy. We didn't know what we were doing technically, we just made it for made messes in Maya just so we could see what we were going to plan things out and then hand that model which wanted to kill us but but um, <laughs> but we, we but we had a plan and we could draw from that and build on that. And and then I think it was like such we started to rebuild um, in this process. So yeah, it, it's it's huge. I, I just think it's we can't successfully <laughs> do it without you know, forgetting the tools as well. I I didn't see it. Okay, I think there's only time for two more questions because we want to make sure that all these lovely, beautiful people can ask questions as well. But my question for Paul, this one, this <laughs> Paul, is you worked in live action and you worked in it before, I believe you did animation, and designing worlds for older people, <laughs> how I describe it. And even what if for older audiences, a lot of people say also adult animation, but that sounds like to me, so <laughs> got older people uh, animation, and I was curious. Um, right now, for adults, older people animation, a lot of people, it's like that 2D sitcom look. Um, that's how people stereotype it. What do you see now? There's a huge growth area in older people animation, <laughs> and so I was wondering what you see are um, where it's going next, and where the opportunities and challenges for broadening older people animation from just the 2D sitcoms. There's got to be a better term than that. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to have a better answer than that. Mature animation? Adult animation? TV animation? In discerning adults? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I mean, for those of us who've been in animation for a few years now, we have seen things shift in the last probably only in the last 10 years, where, you know, and a lot of it just comes down to what the studios want, because ultimately they're the ones paying for it. Um, but the audiences, I think, have been there all along. There just hasn't been a, um, like, a studio willing to put stuff out. But, I mean, certainly in Japan, they've been doing, you know, animation not for little kids, I think, since they started. But at least here in the United States, animation was always kind of thought of from the studio standpoint as children's entertainment, but I mean, pretty much everybody in this room, I'm sure, who's, you know, is 
not a little kid digs animation. So clearly, there's an audience out there. But you know, I think in the last few years, we've started to see a lot more of this stuff. And I, I mean, personally, I think it's wonderful because when I started out in the industry, I, I didn't really have an interest in animation. I was, I, I did start at Disney. I started in their live action uh, effects division. And I knew a number of people who worked over, you know, I mean, across the street at, at Disney Feature. And I was friends with a, a number of them, and I was invited, you know, pretty early on to come and join them. I just really didn't want anything to do with it. This was actually during, um, I'm going to age myself, this was during the um, Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, um, uh, very almost that movie. Little Mermaid. Little Mermaid, thank you. That, it was during that period when I started, and you know, I, just, I, I really, I mean, I love it. I, mean, I would see all the movies, wasn't interested in working on it. And it really was when Prince of Egypt happened, and I got that gig that was even presented to me as we're going to do this movie that takes place in Egypt, and we're actually, we're, we need to find people who are okay with dealing with pretty hardcore architecture. The whole movie's going to take place in Egypt, and it turns out we, there wasn't that much architecture. There was a little bit, but but they really needed kind of people who more had a more live action sensibility. And when they said the movie's going to be called this, it's basically going to be the Ten Commandments, um, but it's called the Prince of Egypt. And for some reason, that the name actually even was sounded cool. So that was when I jumped, and I've, I've been other than that one little New Zealand detour. I've been in animation since then, it's been 20 some odd years. But, you know, I, now, like now all of a sudden, of course, you know, there's so much what we'll call adult animation. I mean, that's what's kind of started that kicking into real high gear. Um, the show I'm on right now is it's with Marvel. It's, you know, we're, we're actually gonna, I'm in this room, are we, are we recording this? I don't know, are we recording this? Oh, okay. <laughs> now I'm <laughs> How do I say it without breaking any contracts? Um, <laughs> some of our upcoming episodes um, will be like you know basically considered adult. I mean, I think we're even going to get like a, a, a higher you know a TVMA rating. Um, don't quote me on it because I don't know what what actually that's going to pan out. But that's kind of where we're aiming, and that's really I mean this Disney don't no, forget I mean, Marvel is Disney, so that's really new for them certainly. But um, even for the, you know, the standards and practices people, the ones who figure out ratings for, for TV shows and stuff, you know, it, it comes down to the studio to push for this kind of stuff. So like this one show that I might be working on um, is going to have a lot of blood in it. And Disney would never, ever, ever do that. And, um, it's just it's against the brand. But um, it's not like we couldn't do it. I mean, you know, again, anime, anime has been doing that for years. It's blood going everywhere. Samurai swords cutting heads off. And here in the United States, you would never be able to do that with, with cartoons. But you know, now it's a big deal. I mean, again, it's the audience. And the studios see it as, as um, you know, if there's a dollar to be made, if people are willing to pay it, that's where they're going to go. I don't know if I answered the question. Oh, it's good. <laughs> okay, my last question is a technology question for Jeff, because you talked about technology. Right, so um, Eric Darnell, who's our chief creative officer, directed the Madagascar films and ants. He has been doing nothing for the last three weeks, probably, other than doing AI art. <laughs> he's so excited about it, and he's using it for inspiration for all the projects we're doing. I'm wondering, it's the hot trend right now, um, what do you think about AI art, and do you see an opportunity to integrate it into the process at all um, with animation? Are you talking about like, uh, like VR? Like yeah. Mind Journey? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah like um, Dolly? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the idea of it. I, I've used it on my current production, just, um, but I think of it more currently right now where I'm at because I think AI art is very new. Um, so it's sort of like it's something fun to do with your friends. Um, a prank you can fall on somebody. You know, like, but it's it's sort of new and fun, and nobody really knows what to do with it. But I think eventually it'll become very helpful. Um, I use it for like a search tool like, in a weird way. Like, you're, when, you know, we talk about our first practices, 
finding photos and <coughs> research and stuff. Um, and what, really, what you're really doing is taking like photos and synthesizing those ideas into one idea or a single thought or you're extrapolating something. And what AI does is it does that for you visually. So like it's kind of stupid right now. I think AI is like very not that smart uh, because it's just coming from a pool of like art and references and things that are like inputted. But I think when it becomes very intelligent, it will be a very helpful tool. Uh, I would never use it for like the end product or something. I think it's, it's good just to jolt you out of your own thinking. Like, oh, I never thought of it like that. You know, tennis shoes on a duck. Um, but I, I think it's going to be a part of our business. It's a, you know, it's just one way to get to the solution faster. Uh, I would just hope that it's news responsible. You know, I, I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about, uh, oh, God, what's a good job? I think every industry is being threatened right now. Um, I don't think that's the case. I, I really don't, because people are more interesting. And I think we make stories that are very emotional. Um, and even if, you know, AI can make convincing things, like, sure we all don't want robots to win, right? So, yeah. support humans. <laughs> um, like, we can all agree with that, right? Uh, but I, it's just a robot. Yeah. Robot. <laughs> but I'm not against it. I'm for anything technology-based that can help you get to where you need to go faster, efficiently, and if it's fun and creative, uh, let's do it. I would like to, for some of these sites, you can feed them all of your images for whatever style and say, draw a cat in the style of Mei Jue, and it's pretty badass. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I did to say one thing. There is a cool, like, I had a thought. I wanted to, I wanted to, I've been trying to reach Jolly, too. So if anybody knows how to, like, do that, talk, talk to me. But I think there's a way to, like, hack the system. Because if it's just grabbing from a pool of, of images, like, you can feed it your own artwork and, like, assets. And then they can, like, design based off the stuff that you've made. And so, like, if it's, just a tool that can do that anyway, it seems like you can like use it and put your own work into it. And then it could just be like a second you. If there's enough of your work out there, like I, I, yeah. I saw an interview with Loish, as you know, which is probably what the most like downloaded artist on Instagram right now. But but she was saying that she put herself in in the search engine to see what would happen and did like a, a draw the New York City skyline in the style of Loish. And she said that it actually did a pretty good job, but it wasn't perfect, and then she kind of like finished it off. But it was, that's a really interesting way to, to but it, again, it, it does come down to how much of your own stuff is out there on the net, because that's really ultimately what it's drawing from, from the internet. So if you have a lot of your own personal work out there, yeah, you might be able to find a nice shortcut. <laughs> Make it so you have no job anymore, but I won't. <laughs> I have a friend who said he decided he wanted to see what the thing would do. So he said, and literally, and this is all, the only prompt was do a picture of a hand, a human hand, and he said he could not do it. Now, this was a particular program he was using. I think he was using Midjourney. Every image of the hand he came up with was some freaky creature hand. The only thing he could think of was the fact that there's probably more images of freaky creature hands out there that are offering on the internet than actually photographs of hands, which are boring. But, so I, again, it's because there's a machine behind it. It's not really, not really thinking. So, at the end of the day, the human filter is, I think that's how we will win. Right, because I'm going to take your, your kids' place because it's the only important one. Sure. Okay, who has a question? I'm going to do this. And this is the lovely Amika who came up with all the questions I asked you guys today. It's awesome for Okay, who has a question? Of everybody arguing and saying, How dare we say this? 
But, and it seems like that can go really quickly. How do you keep things productive, on track, efficient, while also making sure that everybody feels, you know, ideas are being acknowledged and, you know, taken into consideration without to, again, devolving into like things living at my mother's house? Uh, so that's always my question. Um, it depends on, on depends on the studio, I think. Um, it depends on the production schedule, how fast that process goes. Um, I worked on a project where nailing down the style took two or three years. Um, the project I'm working on right now, the, the, the style took one week, um, and it was, it's all based on how much time and money the studios can give you to sit there and play, or or until or, or even more so when they approve. I mean, that's been my experience. El Dorado, we were talking about El Dorado. They had, I don't know, they brought in a team of people, they developed a whole look, beautiful, and they decided to change it, and they did it again. They brought in another team, they did it again, they did it like six times. Every one of them was beautiful. Every one of them would have made a fantastically gorgeous film. But it came down to the studio approving it or not. The show I'm on right now, it was like, they, they hired me, it's like, we're in production in one week. You know, it's like, okay, well, we gotta get the lights on and the computers running. <laughs> And we started, we just started, you know. And, and we actually ended up changing the style about three or four weeks later because we realized it didn't work. But um, it's kind of just like, it's how much air do you put in a room, whatever fits, <laughs> whatever you've got time for. And to keep everybody on track, that is the hard part. It is the hard part because it's, it's, you gotta make sure everybody, for me the way to keep everybody on track is hire people that you can already do. Back to the, the team thing. Next question. Oh. Hi, my name is Adela. Thank you for having me. Um, I do production design, live action in New York and in California, and I love to transition into animation because that's what I really love. But um, I do two D animation already. But how? What skills would I need from my live action? Production design to transfer that over to animation. Like, what more can I do? Like, what? Yeah, I don't know. How would I transition? Thank you. So, uh, I, I'm working with a, a, a consulting live action production designer on a project I'm on right now, and it feels like the two are it feels like the two are kind of uh, converging in a lot of ways because we all talked about like introducing 3D early into the process and um, the. Consulting design that we're working with does that automatically at the beginning because you have to have everything be planned out for the first day of shooting. So it's, it's natural for him to, to want to like imagine everything eventually first. I'm more old school, it's, it's taken me a while to come around to that thinking, but it's, it's, I can think of an example of a way that the processes are diverging in a lot of ways. I'm going to just give a simple other quick thing is that for the most part, and it's not not a, a rule, for the most part the production designers are expected to literally come up with the style themselves oftentimes. I mean actually do paintings, um, imagery. So if you're someone who can draw and paint, um, then you're probably going to have a better a better chance or an easier chance of making the transition than if you're not someone who draws and paints. And again, that's, that's, I know some production designers who literally never pick up a pencil. Um, and they're, they're rare in the industry. I think, there's, I think that's becoming more and more and more of them. Um, I worked with a production designer um, who, was, who came from live action at DreamWorks. He actually had a fair amount of trouble. I think it was partly because the studio didn't entirely trust him unless he was literally putting out imagery himself. So it's just something to think about. Thank you so much.
working with, and he was like a great example of like somebody who made because it's a balance. You have to, you know, all the artists that you work with also have personal goals. You know, they want to they they want to grow in certain directions, and um, it's a long time, so to keep them invested in the project is a lot of work. Sometimes it's kind of like um, it's a little bit of almost like even like therapy. <laughs> Like, what do you want to do? Like, where do you want to grow? And giving them those opportunities and making them feel heard is very, it's a really tough balance and it's part of um, managing people in this job that it, it, I think can be underestimated how much you have to actually be a little bit of a people person and be, like, I think what's helped me the most learn from um, my old bosses is, like, the, the thing I, and, and, and kind of uh, Paul said it, it's like, it's giving your artists the funnest stuff, almost. You know, like I, like I, for Amraya, I didn't do a lot of very um, ugly drawings, like drawers or models and stuff, just to push it through the pipeline. But you leave as much as you can, um, you know, opportunities for for artists to, you know, if somebody's been doing a set for a really long time and they're really burnt out, maybe give them an opportunity to stress their wings and do some beautiful paintings. Or like, you don't want to keep somebody so. Um, pigeonholed into something that they feel like they can't grow. And that's a huge part of keeping your team invested and happy, and, um, and, and everybody has to deal with it for like two, three years, so why make it like, it, it needs to be, you know, it needs to be balanced. One, one thing I always try to do is uh, involve my artists in the process a little bit more, so they were, I was always trying to, you know, remind them that they're not just making pretty pictures, but they're making uh, information that other artists are going to have to interpret and that they forge this relationship with the mom and the team and the materials team and whatever. So they understand how their artwork is received and might be interpreted. But then as their artwork gets taken through the, the process, they get rewarded by really seeing how, how it came through. And, and then when they might be feeling burned out, they're like reinvigorated because they're like, oh, that was really cool, awesome. Now, now they're moving on to the next thing. So it's, Trying to get, get them invested in, in the whole process, not just not just the content. Thanks, Helen. Um, I think for me, it's it's like a, you know, like your role is to come on. But the coolest part of this job is you come on first, because we're all like excited to start something new. We just probably not be sure. <clears throat> and you want to just do some work, so I think like knowing what, like when you get to do that. So you get to do that in the beginning, and then when, when you start bringing artists on, you need to start backing away. Because as you're, at that point, your job is, I mean, you do work, you, know, you obviously have to, have to be competent and do stuff, but like your job is not to like keep making work, it's to have the vision and to maintain that vision. And you have to repeat yourself over and over and over again. And it's worth it. Um, but you know, Helen's right, like, I think the, the coolest part of your job is bragging about people. Um, and, and do it and embarrass the hell out of them. Like, do it in the meeting with the director and just like, do it till they fall out of the chair. Uh, it's because it's fun. And it's, it's rewarding to like, work, with, work with people you respect, you admire, um, and, and that comes back to you because they'll give you the best work they, they can possibly do. Uh, it's just, it comes down to respect and knowing what it's like to be in that situation uh, and not forgetting it. So it's, it's hard. You're getting direction from a production designer, from the director, from even your peers, and you're trying to put all these things together. Uh, and so you can be a huge support to them uh, and, and just like, well, just trust them and give them, give them autonomy. Uh, you'll get better work from them. So, yeah, everybody's happy. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you everyone so much for coming to the